So how is everybody doing today? It is good to be back here in Norfolk, even though we're in uh, unusual circumstances, I guess, and not our usual cozy confines. Uh, my name is Paulo Di Gregorio. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a historian and archaeologist and a lecturer. And today we are going to dive into the history of Ireland. Now, why are we going to be talking about Ireland? St. Patrick's Day. Uh, what's happening in like a week or so? <laughs> 11 days or so, right? St. Patrick's Day. So since it is March, since it is uh, in the run-up to St. Patrick's Day, it seems appropriate to do a quick history of Ireland. Uh, now, I've called this talk a ferocious tenacity, the saga of Ireland, and I'll explain that title in a minute. But, uh, and I'm going to be walking back and forth a lot for the entire presentation here. So when we think of Ireland, what pops into your mind? What kind of sights or scenes or sounds? Blarney, Blarney green. Um, anything like that? Uh, in, in a lot of ways, I'm going to move from in front of the projector. <laughs> what you have there is a, an encapsulation of Ireland and the Irish countryside. You have the green, you have kind of these stormy skies, you have the old monastery there, the medieval monastery. And here in the foreground, you have sheep. And of course, the sheep play an important role in the story of Ireland because that's where we get these lovely Irish sweaters. Sir, do you want to stand up and model for us? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so those sweaters that are kind of synonymous with Ireland are because of the lots of sheep that are there. And the sheep, of course, feed on the green that is around uh, on the island itself. Now, what about the title of this talk, that ferocious tenacity? Well, I took that title from a quote from the Irish writer Edna O'Brien. She makes a statement that kind of resonated with me and kind of is fitting for the talk. She says, when, anybody, when anyone asks me about the Irish character, I say, look at the trees, maimed, stark, and misshapen, but ferociously tenacious. You get, get a view of that right here. The um, tumultuous weather in Ireland, the winds, the weather, the rain have all shaped the Irish character much as, they, uh, as they've shaped the Irish trees that we see here in the foreground. So that's where I get the title for this talk. That is where the idea for this, this presentation came from. Now, where do we begin our story? Where do we begin our story of Irish history and talking about uh, the emergence of Irish character? Well, how about with that guy? Uh, St. Patrick, who we will all be celebrating uh, next Friday. I think St. Patrick's Day is on a Friday this year, right? That's not going to be a problem at all. Um, <laughs> next Friday, while we are drinking our green beer and eating our corned beef and cabbage, St. Patrick. Now, who was St. Patrick? He chased. Uh, well, we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> he was not Irish, first and foremost. He was probably a Romanized Briton probably from Wales, but certainly influenced by Roman culture, by the culture of the Roman Empire. And in the 5th century, uh, he actually arrives in Ireland. Now, he has two stints in Ireland, I guess we could say. As a young man, Patrick, this Welshman, probably from Wales, was kidnapped by Irish pirates and enslaved in Ireland. He does eventually gain his freedom, goes back to his homeland, where he trains in, in uh, the study of religion. He becomes a monk, he becomes a priest, and then is sent to Ireland to bring Christianity to that island. Now, why is Patrick sent there? Because he has experience among the Irish, so he seemed like a fitting, um, a fitting person to carry on this missionary work. We have to remember that this period in history saw an expansion of uh, Christianity across the Mediterranean world, across the European environment. You have uh, missionaries going to Scotland, people like uh, St. Columba on the island of Iona, and you have Patrick coming here to Ireland. Now, when we think of St. Patrick, what is the color that's associated with him? Green. Well, that's a trick question because the actual official color, saints have official colors, for St. Patrick is the blue. The green is Ireland, the blue is St. Patrick. So we have Patrick, the, the uh, 
I don't want to call him the prophet, but certainly the missionary of the Irish who brings Christianity to Ireland itself. Now, what about the snakes? If we notice in this image here at St. Patrick's feet, what's he doing there? He's commanding the snakes out of Ireland. That is um, a myth that's associated with St. Patrick. There is no evidence that snakes ever lived in Ireland. So it was pretty easy for Patrick to get rid of them if there were no snakes there. But uh, perhaps symbolically, it, it is St. Patrick pushing evil, sending Satan the devil out of, out of Ireland itself. So we do see this, um, this symbolism in the story of St. Patrick getting rid of the snakes in Ireland. So Patrick comes along, other missionaries come along to Ireland, and they do begin to Christianize the Celts, the native inhabitants of the island. Um, one of the stories that is associated with St. Patrick is that in order to kind of teach some of the basic ideas of Christianity, he embraces some of the, uh, the natural life of Ireland. One of the important concepts in Christianity, it's kind of a, a difficult concept to understand, is the idea of the Trinity. The idea that you have one God who is made up of three parts, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Well, how, according to legend, does Patrick and his, his missionaries teach this to the Irish, to the Celts. Well, you use the shamrock, right? The, sim uh, the, the plant that becomes one of the symbols of Ireland, one of the, the things we celebrate on St. Patrick's Day. The shamrock, if we look at it, has three distinct leaves that form the larger whole. Much as the Trinity, according to Christian uh, theology, you have the three parts of God that create the one whole God. So you have um, Patrick going out and preaching to the leaders of the Celts, the various kings and, and princes of Ireland. We see dramatically depicted here and over there uh, the introduction of this theology, the introduction of this idea, the introductions of stories of salvation that Patrick and his missionaries do bring to the Irish. And um, Patrick and other Christian missionaries are remarkably successful. What we see over the course of the fifth century in the 6th and 7th centuries, is that most of the Celtic population of Ireland do embrace Christianity. And Ireland, though it is on the fringes of Europe, does become one of the centers of Christian uh, scholarship and scholasticism and monasticism. You see lots of monasteries established across the Irish countryside. Now, monasteries in the period that we today call the Middle Ages served a very important role. They were centers of education. They were centers of knowledge. They were centers of um, the, the uh, maintenance of culture and civilization. What do the monks do? Well, what do monks do? One is they pray, two is they teach, and three is they, co they copied manuscripts. They copied ancient texts by hand. They, they maintained this literary scholastic tradition from the ancient world. So the establishment of these monasteries across the Irish countryside are hugely important for the development of not only Christianity, but for the development of Irish civilization. Because you do have these repositories of knowledge, you do have these centers that become centers of commerce that are, are uh, important roles in the development of Irish civilization, the, the shape of Irish culture itself. So Irish monasticism does play an important role in the, the Christian tradition, in the Western tradition, particularly in the fifth century when the Roman Empire itself in the West collapses, when you have these so-called uh, barbarian hordes, the Germanic tribes, crossing the border, crossing the Danube, and toppling the power of the Roman Empire, and um, really shaking the structures of Roman society. You have these outposts, again, on the fringes of Europe that maintain the Christian tradition, that maintain the knowledge of antiquity in many of these monasteries. And because the monks were often isolated in these monasteries, spending hours a day copying ancient texts, um, they do start to become a little bit creative. You have to kind of vent your creativity. You have to find a way of expressing yourself in the copying of ancient Latin texts. It's not a very entertaining thing to do. So what do we see happening during this time period? But the development of what come to be called illuminated manuscripts. Ancient texts, Latin texts that have colorful drawings, colorful images throughout the text, along the edges, uh, giant colorful letters at the beginning of each page. The Irish do become uh, hugely influential in the development of this tradition of 
of illuminated manuscripts. And in fact, it is among the Celts in Scotland and in Ireland that perhaps one of the greatest of the illuminated manuscripts of the Middle Ages is created, the famous Book of Kells. The Book of Kells probably was begun in Scotland, but was probably completed in Ireland. Um, and it was certainly influenced by Irish artistic tradition. So even while those Scottish monks were working on it, they were being influenced by developments that were coming out of Ireland. Now, what is the Book of Kells? Well, it is a, a transcription of the New Testament of the Bible, the Christian uh, text of the Bible. And it is a collection of the four Gospels of the New Testament, which you see depicted here, the four evangelists with their animal uh, representation there in the Book of Kells. It is, the Book of Kells itself, which is created around the year 800, a few decades before and a few decades after, is a hugely illustrated, vibrantly colorful um, copy of the, the New Testament stories. Uh, there are some scholars who, looking at the Book of Kells, thinks that the, think that the artists probably spent more time on the images than they actually did on the text. You have these vibrant images and then kind of small text written throughout. So this was meant to be eye-catching. It was meant to be something that was a display piece, not necessarily something you were reading quietly in your room at night. This was something that was showy, that was going to sit up on the altar at the front of a church and everybody was going to ooh and ah over it, much as they do today. Uh, so you have these images from from the, the New Testament, from the Book of Kells. I particularly like this one. Um, I often refer to that as Surfer Jesus, because if you look at him, he's got this long flowing blonde hair and kind of this goatee there in the middle. Looks like he'd be at home in, in Southern California as well as here in Ireland. Um, but you have the Book of Kells as this example of this Irish monasticism and the maintenance of this tradition, the, the uh, preservation of knowledge, the preservation of ancient texts that we see going on here. So for much of this period that we call the Middle Ages, the monasteries were the center of intellectualism, were the center of culture in Ireland. And we see this distinctly Christian Irish uh, culture developing on the island itself. But then something happens. Uh, somebody arrives in Ireland that will play a role in kind of disrupting society and culture on the island. And that's those guys. The Vikings. Now who are the Vikings? The Vikings were uh, from Scandinavia. They were from Norway, Sweden, Denmark. They were in the uh, beginning in the late 8th century raiders who leave their homeland going out to find uh, fertile ground for them to, to settle on, going out to find treasure. Uh, the Vikings de develop a tremendously fearsome reputation because, you know, they would go and, and slaughter villages to establish themselves there. Uh, the Vikings do kind of get a bad rap in history in a lot of ways, but the Vikings were also people who were looking to explore, who were looking to push beyond the borders of what they knew. They traveled by longboat, which were these incredibly um, technologically advanced seagoing vessels. They were uh, stable on the open ocean, and they could travel thousands of miles across the open ocean. In fact, some Vikings do make it to North America around the year 1000. Uh, and they were shallow drafts, so they could go up and down rivers. And of course, what did the Vikings do? They go up and down the rivers of Western Europe and Eastern Europe and raid and pillage and settle and all that sort of thing. So the Vikings come along, leaving Scandinavia around the 8th century, and they for lack of a better term, wreak havoc on Western Europe, particularly the British Isles, particularly uh, Britain, Scotland, and Ireland. Now, why were those places easy targets for the, uh, for the Vikings? <laughs> they were close by. They were accessible by sea, and also they weren't very well organized in terms of government. They were very decentralized. Plus, Along the coast of Ireland, Scotland, and England, what did you have a lot of? Monasteries. A lot of monasteries. And what was in those monasteries? A lot of guys who were busy drawing in their books, uh, but men who did not have swords, very important, and places where there was lots of treasure. The monasteries were wealthy because people gave gifts to the monastery. So the monasteries were easy pickings for the Vikings. Now, I do want to uh, point this guy out over here. 
Uh, very stereotypical looking Viking, right? Big horned helmet, the wings coming off of it. That is completely historically inaccurate. The Vikings did not wear horned helmets. They did not have giant wings coming off of their helmets. They wore regular plain helmets. Um, this image is the product of 19th century Wagnerian opera coming out of uh, Richard, Richard Wagner in Germany. Uh, dramatic opera, you know, the, when the fat lady sings type opera. Uh, the Vikings did not wear helmets like that at all. Uh, that is very inefficient in battle. Um, so uh, it's a dramatic image, but very, very inaccurate. In any case, the Vikings show up on the coast of Ireland around the ninth, uh, the, the turn of the ninth century, late eighth century, going into the early ninth century. And they do what Vikings do. They attack some monasteries, they do some pillaging, but they also settle. And in fact, the presence of the Vikings is hugely important in the story of many of the Irish communities, Irish cities. Um, the, the Vikings come and they settle along the coast, along the rivers, and they establish the roots of what will later become Irish cities. Uh, places like Dublin that we see there on the left, that is Viking Dublin along the River Liffey. Uh, you can see the Viking settlement surrounded by the, the uh, fort around it, the, the walls. That was where the Vikings settled. That was a Viking center of population in Ireland during that period. And this map over here shows us the middle of the 10th century in Ireland. Again, Ireland divided up into these many kingdoms, but we look here at Dublin, at Wexford, at Waterford, at Cork, at Limerick. Those were all Viking settlements, and the countryside around them were controlled by the Vikings. So these Vikings, these Norse raiders and explorers, do settle in Ireland, and they do develop these centers of power, these, these um, settlements along the Irish coast. The rest of Ireland, these bigger patches of color, were divided up among various clans, various kings on the island itself. So you'd have uh, the King of Munster over here, the King of Leinster over here, the Kings of Northern Ireland over here. They were separate kingdoms, and those kings were often rivals of one another. They were often at war with one another, which really weakened their position when it came to facing the Vikings because the Vikings were fierce warriors, and though they weren't there in large numbers, they were able to exploit some of those political weaknesses in Ireland itself to establish their control, to establish their, their influence on the island. Despite that, the Irish, though fighting amongst themselves, usually viewed the Vikings as outsiders, as uh, threats to the Irish way of life, and we do see a lot of warfare, a lot of struggle between the various Irish kingdoms and the Vikings that had settled on the coast. What that leads to is eventually a, I don't want to call it a union of Ireland, but a unification of sorts that takes place in Ireland. And it gives rise to um, a legendary figure in Irish history, a king known as Brian Boru. How many of you have heard of Brian Boru? He's kind of a, a quasi-mythical figure in Irish history. His deeds have been celebrated by poets and in song and that sort of thing. Brian Boru is an actual historical figure. He was the king of Munster in southern uh, Ireland, down over here. Uh, this is a kind of dramatic, cartoonish recreation of what Brian Boru may have looked like. We don't actually have any idea what he actually looked like. Uh, he manages to um, sort of unify the Irish kingdoms. He manages to defeat his political rivals in Ireland through diplomacy, through warfare, and emerge as the acknowledged high king of Ireland. Now, what did that mean is that he was the, the king above all the other kings. So you had still these various Irish kingdoms, each with their own nobility, their own ruling family. But Brian, Brian Baru, through his leadership, through his skill, through his diplomacy, is acknowledged as the first among all of these kings, the high kingship. The high kingship of Ireland does become symbolically important because the person who claimed that title essentially claimed to be the, um, the overall person in charge of Ireland with overall command. Though you still had this fragmentation in these various kingdoms, they were the ones overseeing nominally in charge of everything that was happening in the island. So what happens? Well, Brian Baru does achieve this, this status of high kingship by the late 9th, uh, excuse me, by the late 10th, early 11th century, and uh, sets about to focus on getting rid of the Vikings, kicking the Vikings out of Ireland. Now, what that involves is a lot of warfare. 
So in the early 11th century, we do see a lot of struggle in Ireland as various factions, various forces are fighting against one another. Now, though Brian Baru was the high king, the acknowledged high king of Ireland, there were some Irish kings who still allied themselves with the Vikings. Why? Because they figured if we ally ourselves with the Vikings, that strengthens our position versus Brian Baru and his family. So you still had those internal politics at play. But what we see from about 1002 to about 1014 is this, this military struggle, this endeavor to kick the Vikings out of the island, to push the Viking presence off of Ireland itself. Well, ultimately, what that leads to is a, a celebrated battle that takes place in what is today the outskirts of Dublin, the Battle of Clontarf. This takes place in April of 1014. And by most historical accounts of the battle, this was a gigantic titanic struggle. You had armies of um, thousands of men, which at that time was a large military force. And by many of the contemporary accounts, or as close to contemporary as possible, the battle was tremendously bloody. Uh, it's estimated that there were 10 to 11,000 casualties in the battle, which again for a battle in the 11th century was tremendously bloody, tremendously destructive. What you had was Brian Baru and many of the Irish kings facing off against the Vikings, some new Scandinavians who had come in, some um, inhabitants of the various islands uh, off the coast of Ireland, and some Irish lords that had sided with the Vikings facing off here at Clontarf and fighting this massive battle. Now, ultimately, what occurs is that the, the Irish, the uh, Brian Baru faction, do claim victory. Fewer of their men died, the Vikings and the, their allies do flee the field. But this is a tremendously costly battle because in the aftermath, Brian Baru himself is killed. He dies as a result of this battle. Many members of the Irish nobility are killed as a result of this battle. Now, Brian Baru himself um, probably did not die on the battlefield. Uh, at this point, he was relatively old, uh, and he was not directly involved in the fighting. He was back in his camp, kind of directing the operations from there. And the story is that when his enemies were retreating, they happened to retreat past where his tent was. And they went into the tent, and there was Brian Baru laid out on his cot, and they stabbed him to death, uh, which we see dramatically illustrated kind of over here, Brian Baru in his tent. So while this destruction was going on and the fate of Ireland was being decided, more or less, uh, Brian Baru was ill in his tent, and he's eventually killed by his enemies as they are fleeing the battlefield. This event, the Battle of Clontarf, is often celebrated as the, the end of the Irish presence, excuse me, the Viking presence in Ireland. That is not necessarily historically accurate. The Viking influence is certainly greatly reduced, but the Vikings do remain in the area of Dublin for many more years after this battle. Now, what's kind of interesting is that we know the name of the battle. We know roughly where it was fought, but nobody actually knows where the specific battlefield was. And a lot of the details of the battle are very, very mysterious. There were no historical sources, no historical records of the battle in its immediate aftermath. The earliest records of the battle are written many years later. So the accuracy of those records is, is questionable. We know that this battle occurred. There was this massive political shift. We know that Brian Baru died in the aftermath of the battle, but we don't know any of the details of the battle itself. The estimates of how many people died are purely scholarly guesses by the few records that we do have, the few stories that were told in the years after the battle. But the Battle of Clontarf is often celebrated as this moment where the Irish get rid of or begin the process of getting rid of the Vikings, these invading forces. So um, what we see is that by the early 11th century, the the Irish kings once again rule Ireland. The family of Brian Baru, though they claim the title of high kingship, really doesn't have the influence that they did under his reign. The title is still there, but the position itself is, is very much weaker. And what does that mean? Well, it means that Ireland essentially settles into a period of, of protracted political struggle between the various clans, between the various kingdoms. Everybody wants to kind of be the one in charge, wants to claim the high kingship, but nobody really has the power, the influence to do so. And that remains the situation for about 100 years or so until the middle of the 12th century. 
In the middle of the 12th century, there is a change that occurs in Irish politics. And it has to do once again with another outside force, another group from beyond Ireland that begins to make its presence felt in the island. And that group are the Normans. Now, who are the Normans? They're from Normandy, certainly they're from Normandy, but by the time we get to the middle of the 12th century, they're also from England. In 1066, the Normans conquer England with uh, um, William the Conqueror. Now, before 1066, who were the Normans? Well, they were actually, they were Vikings. They were the, dis the Vikings who settled in northern France, the term Norman, the North men, people from the north, uh, who are uh, given titles to that land by the kings of France in the hopes of the, uh, the king of France was hoping to create alliances. So the Normans were essentially Vikings, uh, were transplanted Vikings coming from northern France into England and now in the 12th century making their way into Ireland. Well, how did the Normans get into Ireland? The, the figure who is largely responsible for that is this knight right here, Richard de Clare. We know he is Norman because he has a nice French sounding name there. Uh, who was a Norman English knight who in the uh, around 1168, 1169 um, is invited into Ireland by a, an Irish king who had been deposed, who had been chased from his, his throne. The king of Leinster, uh, a man named McMurda, had lost his throne and had been sent into exile. He goes into exile in England. Well, there in England, you have a bunch of Norman knights who are looking for something to do. The Normans are renowned for their, their uh, ability as warriors. They were, they were men of action. They didn't necessarily like to sit around in England. They wanted to go beat people up. That's that Viking heritage, I guess. And you have these Norman knights who are bored, who are looking for opportunity, looking for an, uh, an opportunity to, to make a name for themselves, to increase their power, their influence, that sort of thing. So you have this Irish king in, uh, in England saying, hey, I want to get my throne back. Who wants to help me? And uh, Richard de Clare, who comes to be known as Strongbow, that's a, a nickname he gets much after his lifetime, but he uh, sees an opportunity there and he says, I'll come help you. And he begins to gather up some knights with him on the uh, west coast of England. Well, the king of England, Henry II, isn't real happy about this. And he forbids any Norman knights from sailing to Ireland. But Richard de Clare says, you know what? He's the king of England. I'm going to be leaving England. I'm going to Ireland. I'm not going to, not going to necessarily listen to him. So Strongbow gathers up his army and with McMurdo and his, his supporters sails to Ireland and there begins to fight against the Irish lords. What you have are the Normans now coming into Ireland and um, waging war against the Irish themselves. Now here's the situation in Ireland uh, in the aftermath of Richard de Clare of Strongbow. He is successful in waging war. He does bring his troops. He does begin to pacify part of the area. Uh, McMurdo gets back on his throne in Leinster, but he's not real popular there. He becomes kind of notorious historically. And we have this situation where the Normans have now made an inroads into Ireland. Now, um, why would Richard de Clare want to take this risk of, you know, disobeying the King of England and maybe facing defeat in Ireland? Well, one is that he was politically ambitious. He realized that if he's victorious, he can gain territory, he can gain wealth and that sort of thing. But also, uh, the King of Leinster had promised Strongbow his daughter's hand in marriage. So here you have a, a, a knight toward the end of his knighting career being promised the hand of a fair Irish maiden, 17-year-old um, Ava. <laughs> so like any good Norman, uh, he does invade Ireland. He does win some battles. And in 1170, marries Ava, uh, this, which is depicted there in that very dramatic image. Now, this marriage actually takes place in the middle of a battle. Um, Strongbow is attacking the town of Wexford, I think. He has besieged the city. The Normans have breached the walls. They're running through the streets, massacring everybody, hence all the dead bodies here in the foreground. When McMurdo, the now reimposed and stated king of uh, Leinster, says, no, stop, stop the fighting. We're going to stop killing everybody. We have to get this marriage done. So there, as there are people dying in the streets, uh, Ava and Strongbow are married in the church 
in the town. And then their wedding procession goes out and they're supposedly stepping over these uh, decapitated bodies in the streets. Um, and what you have essentially, symbolically, is the marriage of Ireland and England. You have this, the English presence now being inserted into Ireland and into Irish politics. Now, some Irish historians have said, well, it's kind of fitting that the beginning of this comes out of blood and destruction, because what is the relationship between Ireland and England? Uh, for much of that history, there is a lot of blood, there is a lot of destruction. So all of this becomes symbolic of this. And even though we have this great rainbow in the background kind of blessing and sanctifying this union, we do have to remember that it does emerge out of the chaos of war and destruction and um, death in the streets. So what we have by 1170 is an English presence in Ireland. Once again, you have outsiders coming into Ireland and taking territory in Ireland as their own. Now, the action of Strongbow and this marriage and his establishment in Ireland, um, of course, does cause some problems back in England because he did disobey his king. He did dis disobey Henry II. But Henry, uh, the king of England, was nothing if not practical. And he realized that now that a Norman knight had a foothold in Ireland, it kind of opened the door for other Normans to make their way into Ireland particularly the king himself. And what we see in the next few years after this marriage is that the Irish, uh, the English, start to become more and more deeply involved in Ireland. There you see Henry II, king of Ireland. He begins to send knights to Ireland to subdue the countryside, to establish English claim to Irish territory. The English show up and they start building these massive stone castles. Uh, that was a Norman innovation. The Normans bring those stone castles to England in the 11th century. Now the English Normans are bringing those to Ireland in the 12th century. Those stone castles were hugely significant because they represented a couple of things. One, they represented power. I have the power to build these castles. If I build a castle here, I am claiming all the land that this castle uh, sits in. I can see all this territory that is all mine. And by building a stone castle, it's also symbolizing permanence. Castle isn't going to burn down. It's going to be here forever. And in fact, nearly a thousand years later, we still have some of these Norman castles scattered across the countryside, right? So those were tremendously powerful uh, tr symbols of Henry's authority in Ireland. And what we see is that as more and more Normans are coming, more and more Norman knights are coming, the English begin to establish their hold here on the east coast of Ireland. They begin to push out here toward the uh, northwestern coast of Ireland. And they establish what comes to be called the Pale. The Pale was the territory that was under English control, at least nominal English control, in Ireland. Generally, it's considered this area around Dublin and the east coast of the island. But at points, it did extend further out into the Irish countryside. And what we see established here is a deeper English presence, territory in Ireland claimed directly by the English king, by Henry II, and really the, uh, the growing complications in that relationship between Ireland and England, and growing confrontation between the Irish lords and the English lords. Who controls Ireland? Who owns what? Who has precedence in the island? So uh, much of the history of Ireland that we are familiar with, the modern history of Ireland, has its origins here in the 12th century with the invasion of the Normans, with the arrival of the Normans, and the growing presence of the English in the 1170s and 1180s on, that, on the island. So for much of the latter part of the Middle Ages, this is kind of the situation we have. The Irish and Irish kings holding on to territory, the English and English Norman lords holding on to territory in Ireland, uh, oftentimes confrontation between the two, oftentimes competition between the two, the ebb and flow of the size of the pale over this time period, uh, depending on the strength of the English kings and the strength of the Irish lords. But you have this English presence that is established firmly in Ireland. Ireland. Um, by and large becomes part of the kingdom of England, though it is a separate realm, though it is a separate, a separate state. That remains the situation until we get to 
what we could call the early modern period of European history, of Western history, uh, the 16th century, a period of tremendous transformation in Europe. One of the important things that occurs in Europe during this period is the Reformation, the breaking down of Western Christendom. To this point, to about 1517, most of Western Europe shared a common religion. Most of Western Europe was tied to the papacy in Rome. The Pope was the, the, the uh, high churchman in Western Europe. But what we see in the beginning of the 16th century is that people question the power of the Pope and begin to break away from Rome, begin to break away from the Roman church. That is that, that movement of the Reformation. Uh, the Reformation comes relatively late to England. Uh, Henry VIII, who is the King of England, and we see him there later in life, was early on in his reign a loyal, um, a loyal participant in the Roman church. He was an ally of the Pope. But in the 1530s, Henry wants to divorce his first wife. Uh, the Pope says no, so what does Henry do? He breaks away from the Roman church. He establishes the English church, and he has himself made the head of the English church. Uh, so that he could divorce his wife. Well, with that move, Henry then sees opportunity to kind of um, make a profit, if you will, in this religious reformation by taking back all of the land that had been owned by churches and by monasteries. So in England, we have this movement that's called the dissolution of the monasteries, where a lot of those monastic uh, establishments are taken the land is taken by the king, the monks are kicked out. You have this tremendous social upheaval in England. That spills over to Ireland, particularly the parts of Ireland that had a majority English population, Anglo-Norman population. Much of the Irish population, however, remained loyal to the Pope in Rome. So now we're starting to see a religious divide appearing in Ireland, a religious divide that would really come to, to define much of the struggle, much of the turmoil that occurs on that island. So you have Henry VIII introducing the Reformation. Now Henry, for his part, didn't really want to um, annoy the Irish lords and kind of made concessions to them, said you could practice your religion, you know, stay over there uh, on your island. I'm the, I control this territory, acknowledge me as the king of England and we'll be okay. Uh, Henry's successors, however, do have kind of a different view of the religious situation, particularly his daughter, Elizabeth I. Now, Elizabeth, to understand her reign, you have to kind of look at the threats to her reign early on. Elizabeth was a Protestant princess, the daughter of Henry VIII, the Protestant King of England. But throughout her reign, she faced threats from the Catholic countries of Europe, particularly Spain. So she had a, a profound suspicion, a profound disdain for Catholics. That included the Catholics in Ireland. So we see under Elizabeth I uh, attempts to to segregate the Irish Catholics, to suppress the Irish Catholics. And the religious turmoil really begins to, to emerge during Elizabeth's reign in Ireland. Uh, when Elizabeth dies, she's succeeded by her cousin, James I, who was Scottish. He was from Scotland. And James I was, he cared less about religious issues than Elizabeth did. And the Irish Catholics kind of begin to gain, uh, regain some of the status that they had had prior to Elizabeth's reign. And that continues through many of, uh, through, through James I's son, Charles I. Well, Charles I was one of the least popular English monarchs. Does anybody know what happens to Charles I? Yeah, he, eventually that. Uh, what happens during the reign of Charles I, that you have religious divide in England, you have political divide in England, ultimately a civil war breaks out in England itself be between the royalists, the supporters of Charles I, and the parliamentarians, the ones who believe that parliament should have more power than the king. This political divide is matched by a cultural divide. Most of the royalists, known as the Cavaliers, were... Anglicans, for lack of a better term. They were members of the Church of England. They followed what the king wanted. Most of the parliamentarians tended to be Puritans, a more, uh, I don't want to call them radical, but certainly a more conservative sect of Protestants. They wanted more change in the church. They wanted more uh, reform within the reformed church. So you have this religious divide that is also marking a political divide in England. The civil war breaks out in England. Charles I is fighting to maintain his throne. Now that religious divide and the struggle that breaks out in England 
spills over to Ireland. And what you see in 1641 is the outbreak of an Irish rebellion where Irish Catholic lords begin to try to curtail the influence and the power and the presence of English Protestant lords in Ireland. And you have uh, basically Irish attacks on English settlers in Ireland. Um, scenes of horrific violence taking place is depicted here in some of these woodcuts. Uh, babies on poles there and people being thrown to drown to the river, that sort of thing. You have this sectarian violence, this religious violence that breaks out as a result of the turmoil that is happening in England. Well, ultimately, Charles I in England is um, chased from the throne. He is eventually in um, 1649 um, put on trial for treason and his head is chopped off. You have the period of the regicide in England. Here in Ireland, the Irish lords, the Irish nobility have regained the, the, the supremacy on the island. They have curtailed, they have limited, they have pushed the English settlers off or into a, a various small corners of the island itself. Well, when Charles, uh, Charles I dies, the monarchy is abolished in England temporarily, and it is replaced by the English Commonwealth. Uh, the Commonwealth is governed, is ruled by a guy named Oliver Cromwell, who we see there in the bottom image. Cromwell was very much a Puritan, very much a Protestant reformer, and um, not a big fan of the Irish. Uh, and in 1649, right after the death of the king, Cromwell gathers up an army and invades Ireland. Uh, the invasion and conquest of Ireland by Cromwell and the Commonwealth forces is brutal and bloodthirsty and destructive. The Irish, in many cases, are massacred ruthlessly by English Cromwellian forces. Uh, you see, again, some depictions of that in the images above. And by 1651, 1652, Ireland has been totally suppressed by, uh, by Cromwell and by the English. The position and power of the Irish nobility has been broken. The Irish Catholics are being persecuted in their own, on their own island by, um, by Cromwell, by the English Protestants who established their dominion over the island. Well, Cromwell's rule over England lasts until his death in 1659. He's succeeded by his son, his son who was much less capable as a ruler. And soon in 1660, um, the Commonwealth in England is, is gotten rid of and you have a restoration of the monarchy. Uh, Charles I's son, who had been in exile in France, comes back to England as King Charles II. And you have the restoration of the monarchy there during, under Charles II. Charles II, kind of like his grandfather, didn't really want to deal with the religious issues in Ireland, said, let the, let the Irish Catholics have you know, religious toleration on their island. They can practice their religion freely. Uh, he doesn't go so far as explicitly saying that, but that was generally his sentiment, religious toleration in Ireland. Charles, will rule, uh, Charles II will rule over England until his death in 1685 when he's succeeded by his younger brother, the Duke of York, who then becomes King James II. James II the younger son of Charles I, was in many ways like his father, uh, hard-headed, stubborn, and very unpopular among the English people. And in 1688, James II is chased from the throne in a moment in English history that is called the Glorious Revolution. Um, part of the reason why James II is chased from the, stone is, uh, from the throne is because the English believed that he was Catholic which in fact he was. He had grown up in France. He had married a French Catholic uh, princess. He had priests living in the palace with him. He was a, a closet Catholic. And for the English, that was, um, that was not good because the king was the head of the English Protestant church. So you could not have a Catholic king. So James II is chased uh, off the throne. He is replaced by a, a distant cousin uh, Mary and her husband, William. So William and Mary become the co-monarchs of, of England by uh, 1689, both staunch Protestants. Now, William himself um, had to fight to protect the realm from the supporters of James II. James had the support of France and Spain, Catholic countries, and also the support of many people in Ireland. So what we see is that James begins to rally his supporters in Ireland to fight against the English. And that would be 
uh, tragic for the Irish because what happens is William gathers up an army, brings it to Ireland, fights against the, the supporters of James II there in Ireland. James himself flees back to France where he will spend the rest of his life in exile. And James, uh, excuse me, William establishes English control, Protestant control over Ireland and begins to basically parcel out the land of Ireland to English noblemen, Protestant noblemen. And what we see by the beginning of the 18th century is a dramatic shift in land ownership in Ireland. This map over here on the left showed Irish land ownership in 1641. So right at the, uh, the beginning of the English Civil War, the first Irish rebellion. All of this land in green was predominantly Catholic owned. 60 years later, the situation is entirely different. All of that land in yellow was predominantly Protestant owned, English Protestant owned. What we see in this period through the turmoil of the English Civil War, the, uh, the later uh, Stuarts and the Glorious Revolution is that English Protestants have acquired and taken control of much of the land of Ireland. In fact, by 1703, only about 15% of the land was actually owned by Irishmen. The rest was owned by English landlords, English nobility, who were often absentee landlords. They weren't in Ireland, they were in England. So you see this dramatic shift that occurs because of the religious turmoil over the course of the late 17th century in Ireland. Now, what does that mean? It means that the Irish were basically dispossessed in their own island. The Irish Catholics, though they were numerically a majority, did not have any political say, had very little control of land in their island. And there is a, a growing resentment toward the English that occurs during this period. Now, that resentment doesn't really take place in, uh, doesn't really express itself in outright violence. Sure, certainly there are incidences of violence over the course of the 18th century, but it, it does kind of come to a flowering in literature. There are numerous Irish writers that emerge during this time period that become uh, famous for their satirical plays and their political plays attacking the English, attacking the position of the Protestants in Ireland. Uh, really, the emergence of Irish literature occurs during this time period. That hammering isn't distracting at all, is it? <laughs> um, so you have the emergence of an Irish culture during this, this period of English domination, or English literary, excuse me, an Irish literary culture during this period of English domination of the island itself. Now, that doesn't mean that there wasn't, um, there weren't attempts by the Irish to kick the English out. In fact, one of those is another Irish rebellion right at the end of the 18th century, the Irish Rebellion of 1798. Now this movement was inspired partly by the success of the American Revolution and by what happened in France during the French Revolution. What do we see in both of those instances? But a people who considered themselves oppressed, rising up, overthrowing the yokes of those that were oppressing them. In terms of the Americans, it was the, the British. In terms of the French, it was the nobility and the monarchy. You had the common people rising up to, to assert their freedom, to assert their independence, to assert their liberty. And that's kind of what we see here happening in 1798. Various factions of Irishmen gathered together to attempt to chase the English off the island, attempt to, to chase uh, the Protestants out of Ireland. Now, what we do see in the Irish Rebellion is um, our episodes of Irish versus Irish violence. Many of the English settlers who had come to Ireland, had established themselves in Ireland, had been there for generations, and had, uh, by all accounts, become Irish in their attitude, in their culture, and their beliefs, though they remained Anglican. So they were called the Anglo-Irish. You had the Irish-Irish, the Celtic-Irish who were there. And they may have been neighbors, they may have you know, cooperated with one another, conducted business with one another, but when this uprising began, you really have a religious divide that becomes apparent. The Irish Catholics versus the Anglo-Irish Protestants begin fighting against each other. And it's kind of that, that um, sectarian violence in a way that undermines this Irish rebellion. Because the Irish themselves are divided along those religious lines, they can't really focus on kicking the British out. And this rebellion is eventually suppressed. The English do send armies over here. They do put down this Irish rebellion, this Irish rising. 
This does have political ramifications, though, because to this point, Ireland had been considered part of the British Empire, but separate from Britain. It was its own thing. There was an Irish parliament that met in Dublin, though it was uh, only Protestants were allowed to sit in it. Um, so you had this situation in Ireland. This rebellion shocked London. It shocked the parliament in London. And what do they do? Well, in 1801, they basically take away any sort of sovereignty that Ireland had. What you have in 1801 is an act of union which makes Ireland part of Great Britain. It makes the King of England, the King of Britain now the King of Ireland. The Irish Parliament is dissolved and you have direct rule over Ireland from London. Uh, this union created a couple of things. It created the Union Jack flag that we are today familiar with for the UK, which you see at the, the upper image over there. It, um, many people saw it as kind of a, a forced marriage over here uh, between England, Scotland, and Ireland. You can see it being pres uh, presided over there. And they saw it as a benefit for Ireland because the Irish, who were viewed as somewhat semi-barbaric by the English, are going to be brought into the wealth and the, the civil civilization of England itself, of Great Britain itself. So you have this political transformation in Ireland where rule is now directly from Britain. The Irish no longer have a voice. They are Irish... Uh, representatives in Parliament who will go sit in the Parliament in England, but representation is limited. The members of Parliament for Ireland had to be Protestant, they had to be from the English territories. The Irish Catholics are essentially disenfranchised by this act, and Ireland becomes part of this united British Kingdom. And because of that, Ireland was somewhat viewed as the fringe of empire and was often ignored by Parliament and was seen as a piggy bank for those wealthy English landowners in Ireland, the absentee landlords who um, exploited the, the Irish countryside, the benefit of Ireland. They took the agricultural wealth from Ireland. They taxed the Irish peasants. The Irish themselves, who owned very little of their land, are reduced to essentially being tenant farmers in their own country. And many of the, the poorest of the Irish had very, very hard lives, living in rudimentary shacks. Their diet consisted of basically one crop, one product, and that was the potato. The potato, which of course is a new world crop developed in the Americas, transforms life in Europe when it is introduced into Europe in the 16th century, and it does become the staple crop of the poor in Ireland. Um, which is fine, the potato can sustain a large population, it's very calorie dense, but tragedy does befall Ireland in the middle of the 19th century. In the early 1840s, a fungus, a blight, begins to impact the potato crop in Ireland, leading ultimately to what comes to be called the Great Famine, the Irish Famine, sometimes called the Potato Famine. Between 1845 and 1849, the potato crops in Ireland fail. Now, what, are the, what does that mean? Well, since much of the poor Irish population depended on the potato as their main source of nutrients, as their main source of sustenance. Once the potato crops ceased because they were destroyed by this fungus, that led to wide-scale famine in Ireland. Uh, people were dying in tremendous numbers across the Irish countryside. Now, the Irish do appeal to England, do appeal to their landlords for help. But the English landlords, again, mostly absentee landlords, ignored the plight, uh, were still trying to collect the rents, and people who couldn't collect their rents were often forced out of their homes, as we see over here. The tenant farmers being dragged out of their homes by the, uh, the representatives of the absentee landlords. Um, this event is really one of the defining events in Irish history. It will transform Irish society. It's estimated that there were about 8 million people in Ireland prior to the famine, and that about a million people died, excuse me, about 2 million died and about 2 million left. So the population of Ireland was cut in half in a matter of about five years during the famine. Many of them died, many left. Where did those who, who left come to go to? America. A lot of them ended up here, right, in Boston. 
uh, in New York, in Philadelphia, spreading across the United States, Chicago. Uh, some went to Australia. Uh, many of the leaders of that 18, uh, 1798 rebellion had been sent to Australia uh, because it was a prison colony. So you have a lot of Irish that go to Australia during the famine. But the results of it were dramatic for Ireland. They were tragic for Ireland. You can see on the map here, a population loss across the Irish countryside and more scenes of, of the famine and the destitution and the struggle of the Irish people themselves. Now, when this famine began, the English largely ignored it, but this was something that could not be ignored for a long time. So news of the famine does begin to make its way to England. It does raise concern for many people in England. Supposedly Queen Victoria herself is concerned about the English, but doesn't really, uh, by, by, about the Irish, but doesn't really do anything to, to help them other than telling her ministers, hey, we should do something about the Irish. Uh, it does lead to tragedy. Now, here in the United States, there are, um, the, the Irish famine does cause somewhat of a sensation. And there are rescue missions and supply missions that are sent to Ireland, coming out of Boston, coming out of New York, to try to bring foodstuffs and, and clothing and help to the, uh, the people suffering in the Irish famine. But really, the, the famine itself was so widespread and the, the effects of it were so deeply felt that there was very little that could be done in terms of bringing help to the Irish from outside. So despite the best efforts, there wasn't really a lot that could, could be done. There is an interesting story about the Irish famine that um, a group of Native Americans who had recently been displaced from their own homelands in the southeast of the United States were now moved into reservation land in what is today Oklahoma, heard about the famine and gathered up a small collection among their, their meager belongings and sent money to help relieve the Irish famine. Um, and it is kind of a poignant uh, tale because here you had one people that were being repressed and suffering on this side of the Atlantic Ocean doing what they could, even though it was small, but that gesture was symbolic, it was significant, um, trying to help the Irish on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. In any case, the impact on Ireland of the famine was tragic, it was dramatic, it did lead to many Irishmen leaving Ireland and coming to other parts of the world, particularly the United States and other English-speaking uh, parts of the world. Now, politically, what did the Irish famine do? Well, the Irishmen that remained, that survived the famine, started to become more vocal, pushing for more independence, pointing out that, hey, Britain doesn't care for us, look what happened. You know, two million of us died and they didn't help us at all. So you begin to see more political agitation, more vocal political agitation against English rule. And the notion of home rule starts to become very important among the Irish. Home rule meant that we, Ireland, will rule ourselves. We are no longer part of this English kingdom. And this idea develops and percolates over many uh, decades. In fact, there are certain political organizations that are established here in the United States, groups like the Fenians, who become kind of radical in pushing the idea of uh, Irish home rule and are willing to take uh, terrorist action, frankly, to undertake that home rule to lead to that political change in Ireland itself. Well, it isn't until the 1870s and 1880s that a prominent English politician, William Gladstone, begins to embrace the idea of English home rule, giving the, uh, of Irish home rule, excuse me, giving the Irish more sovereignty, uh, allowing them to govern themselves, to, to, uh, have more control over what is happening in their country. Gladstone was a noted liberal politician in late Victorian England. And he does propose several free soil bills and home rule bills to, in an attempt to benefit the Irish, to, to help the Irish get what they want while, while maintaining the English control over Ireland. So Gladstone does put these bills forward. They are debated ferociously in Parliament. Uh, a lot of times the bills don't come to anything, but Gladstone becomes associated with this idea of home rule, giving the Irish some more independence within the British uh, Dominion. That idea of home rule, however, was tremendously controversial. What we see here are um, various political cartoons debating the issue of home rule. These tend to be pro-English cartoons, pro-British cartoons, as you can see. Uh, the one on the left saying no home rule. Um, the Protestant minority in Ireland 
was terrified that Ireland would become independent, that the Irish Catholics would gain ascendancy in the island. And they did not want Ireland to be separate, a separate country because then they felt that they would be threatened. So by staying as part of the British Empire, as part of Great Britain, their interests were protected. So we see no home rule over there. The same thing in that lower cartoon on the right, Ireland, uh, Ulster, which is in Northern Ireland, being held as part of Britain by John Bull, that representation of, of the British Empire. This one here shows Gladstone with his, um, his hope for, English, uh, for Irish home rule. And what happens when you have home rule? Well, you'd have the house burning down in Ireland. You'd have anarchy, rebellion, insurrection. This was the fear that if the Irish were given more sovereignty, this what kind of chaos would ensue on the island. So though Gladstone and others were pushing for Irish home rule, that idea was fiercely debated and was resisted by many in Ireland, the Protestants in Ireland, and many in Parliament in England. They did not want to let go of Ireland. They did not want to give the Irish more sovereignty. So this situation and this desire for home rule does become a political hot button issue in Britain, in Ireland, during the late 19th century and going into the early 20th century. Ireland remained part of Great Britain. The King of Britain was the King of Scotland, of England, Scotland, and Ireland. So that was part of the King's dominion. And Ireland itself was very divided along these sectarian lines, Catholics versus Protestants. England itself was di di divided over the issue of home rule or maintaining a hold on Ireland itself. Well, in the early 20th century, an event would occur on the continent that would accelerate some of the turmoil in Ireland. And that event is the First World War. When World War I breaks out in 1914, of course, Great Britain is part of the fight. And a lot of British troops are sent to fight on the continent. That moment of turmoil for Britain, of warfare for Britain, did give Irish independence uh, fighters a moment of action. A, they saw an opportunity and they decided to take that opportunity. And what we see in 1916 is the so-called Easter Rising. In April of 1916, uh, the week of Easter, Irish revolutionaries launch an attack on British power in Dublin. They uh, quickly occupy some important buildings in Dublin, including the General Post Office, which is the building you see in the top two photographs there. Um, and issue a declaration of independence for the Irish Republic. Essentially what they state is that um, Ireland, as of this moment, has broken away from Britain. We have created our own Irish state. This rebellion, which lasts for a, roughly a week, catches the English by surprise. And the Irish revolutionaries hoped that it would spread across the island itself. Uh, it really doesn't succeed in doing so. It basically stays localized in Dublin. But you do have this moment where there is an attempt by the Irish to use force to establish their independence from Great Britain. Well, what happens with the Easter Rising? The revolutionaries do issue a proclamation, which we see there on the, um, the left, a proclamation of the establishment of an Irish Republic. Uh, the British government, under King George V, issues a counter-proclamation declaring martial law in Ireland. And what we see are that British troops and Irish Protestant constabulary are sent to suppress the, the Irish Easter Rising. Ultimately, in the end, the Rising does fail. Many of the leaders of the Easter Rising are rounded up. They are imprisoned. Many of them are executed. And this attempt at Irish independence in the midst of the First World War does fail. The Irish, the Easter Rising is a failed attempt to establish independence for Ireland. But it won't be the end of the story because when World War I ends in 1918, the Irish once again strike out trying to establish their independence. And what we see in 1919 to 1921 is the so-called Irish Revolution, also sometimes referred to as the Black and Tan War. The Irish Revolution was largely a guerrilla war waged, waged by Irish revolutionaries to break free from England. Uh, it is a, br a brutal struggle uh, of Irish revolutionaries attacking 
English troops attacking symbols of English power. That lasts for about two years. Ultimately, it does come to an end in uh, 1921 with a, um, a treaty of sorts, the establishment of the Government of Ireland Act, which gave Ireland some sovereignty, self-governance within the British Kingdom, within Great Britain itself. Now, the settlement of the revolution does spark internal division in Ireland. And what we have for the next two years is the Irish Civil War, where we see different factions of Irish Republicans fighting against each other. The, the, the government of Ireland, who supported the treaty with Britain, and the more uh, radical revolutionaries who wanted to break free entirely from Britain. This, English, this Irish Civil War will divide Ireland, Irish, the Irish population and Irish politics. Uh, ultimately, by 1923, the Civil War does come to an end. The uh, factions do settle down, if you will. And what we see is the establishment of what comes to be called the Irish Free State. The Irish Free State um, comprised most of the, the, uh, the island of Ireland itself. There were six northern counties, predominantly Protestant over here, who did not want to join the Irish Free State. Now, the Irish Free State was going to be a self-governing entity within the British Commonwealth. So it was going to be tied to London, tied to the British Crown, but it was going to be self-governing. And the counties, the different sections of the, the island did vote on whether or not they wanted to join the Free State. The six northern counties, predominantly Protestant, voted not to. They wanted to remain part of the Kingdom of Great Britain. Um, so that divide that we see in Ireland today between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland is born here in 1922. The leader uh, of the Irish Free State is this man over here, Eamon de Valera. Uh, who was the first prime minister uh, or president of the Irish Free State. Now, he was one of the participants in the Easter Rising in 1916. And he was imprisoned for his part in that, but he escaped execution. He was not, obviously, not executed in that rising. Why? Because he was actually born in New York. And at his trial, he claimed to be an American citizen and that as an American citizen, the British, who wanted the United States to join them in the war, um, he claimed kind of special status and therefore avoided execution for his participation in the Easter Rising. Uh, perhaps an important moment because he does become a political leader in the Irish Free State. Now the Irish Free State will last until 1937. At that point, a new constitution is written for Ireland. The Irish Free State breaks away from Great Britain and establishes itself as the fully independent Republic of Ireland. So the modern day Republic of Ireland has its origins here in 1937 with this new constitution that is written and with Ireland leaving the Commonwealth of Great Britain. So for much of the 20th century, we have an independent Ireland, but a divided Irish island. The northern provinces tied to Britain, part of Great Britain, and the bulk of Ireland independent as this Republic of Ireland. And that will lead to turmoil. In the 1960s and 70s, going into the, really the end of the 20th century, what we see in Ireland is a period of domestic turmoil, sectarian violence that comes to be called the Troubles. Uh, most of it taking place in Northern Ireland, but certainly impacting the entire island. What you have is a continuation of the medieval struggle between Catholics and Protestants in Ireland. The Protestants who dominated in Northern Ireland wanted to remain part of Britain. The Catholics in Northern Ireland wanted to be part of the Irish Republic. And uh, what that led to was essentially the formation of militias and uh, attacks on one another. The Troubles are a terrible time in Irish history, in Irish society. You have, bless you, you have uh, horrific violence that occurs, dividing communities, dividing families, causing all sorts of turmoil throughout Ireland, really around the world. This, um, the, the violence in the Troubles certainly expands beyond Ireland. Uh, impacts England, it impacts parts of Europe. Um, you have these deep-seated cultural religious divides. Uh, you can see some scenes of the destruction here of the Troubles. Um, bombings in the streets of Belfast, 
armed, masked militiamen as kids are walking to school. Uh, more destruction over here. The British try to quell these by sending in paratroopers and soldiers. And that only makes the tensions worse and the violence spreads. So you have all of this, these incidences of, of bloodshed and destruction and fighting because of the history, the tumultuous history of Ireland itself. One of the most dramatic incidences in the Troubles occurred in January of 1972, an event that comes to be called Bloody Sunday. What we see in the town of Derry in Northern Ireland is a protest march that attracted some 10,000 people. The people were protesting the, um, the imprisonment without trial of um, essentially Irish Republicans, supporters of unification with the Irish Republic. These, uh, these activists were imprisoned by the British government. They were locked away without trial. And this protest march in January of 1972 takes place. It's estimated that about 10,000 people were part of this protest march. Well, the protest was technically illegal in Northern Ireland. So uh, British paratroopers are sent in to kind of corral and disperse the, the gatherings. What happens is that the paratroopers begin uh, firing on the marchers and many people are killed. Some 13 or 14 people are killed. Many others are wounded in the fighting that takes place in this incident that comes to be called Bloody Sunday. One of the most iconic images of the event is that top one that we see there, which shows a, a wounded protest marcher being carried away from the protest. And the man in front uh, with the cloth in his hand is a Catholic priest who was trying to make sure that they were not shot as they were moving away. There's a whole sequence of photographs of that. That priest died recently, within the last five years or so, I believe. Um, so you have this, this incidence of violence, which was typical of what was happening during the Troubles. So for 30 years, Ireland, Northern Ireland, and the Republic of Ireland are essentially torn by this sectarian violence. It was common to have militias fighting against one another. You see all sorts of street violence. You see terrorist attacks. You see all sorts of bloodshed that marked much of the, the modern history of Ireland. Ultimately, what occurs? Well, by the late 1980s, the various factions, the various parties, Britain, the Republic of Ireland, the Irish Republican Army, and uh, the Ulster uh, groups from Ulster, the Northern Irish, decide to negotiate. And what we have are negotiations that take place that culminate in 1998 with the Belfast Agreement, also called the Good Friday Agreement or the Good Friday Accords, because they were signed on Good Friday, 1998. Um, this agreement basically brought an end to the troubles in Ireland. It led to the disarmament of much of the IRA. It led to... Uh, power sharing of a sort in Northern Ireland between the Catholics and the Protestants. It opened the border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. It adjusted the diplomatic relationship between the Republic of Ireland and Great Britain itself. The aim of this was to, to bring peace to Ireland. And remarkably, the Good Friday Accords did that. Uh, though there were a few isolated incidences of violence that occurred after the signing of this agreement, what we see after 1998 is really a pacification of Ireland. The troubles do come to an end. The strained relationship between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic does get normalized. Um, and really, the Good Friday Agreement does lead to, to economic well-being for Ireland. In the early 21st century, Ireland goes through a remarkable the Republic of Ireland goes through a remarkable um, economic boom. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that peace was achieved on the island, that you did have the end of the troubles, the end of that turmoil. Um, so 1998, in a way, marks an end to a chapter in Irish history, a chapter of turmoil, a chapter of, of struggle that goes back centuries. Uh, it wasn't just those troubles. It wasn't just that turmoil of the 20th century. The story of Ireland was one of, of passion. It was one of, of um, danger. It was one of division, but it was also one of survival. It was that ferocious tenacity, as we see in the trees. Now, there is something that I kind of hinted at earlier that I want to end our discussion with, and that is the literary tradition in Ireland. Ireland was a land of 
of turmoil. There was a lot of violence, a lot of action, a lot of political upheaval. Yet in the midst of all of that, the Irish do create some of the, the leading figures of English literature, of Irish literature, of writing in the English language. You have figures like uh, W.B. Yeats and um, James Joyce and Jonathan Swift. <laughs> and I'm forgetting his name, even though it's one of my favorites, Oscar Wilde. <laughs> wow, Oscar Wilde there. That was not me, Oscar Wilde. Uh, you have this remarkable literary tradition that emerges in Ireland from the 18th century, from those uh, satirical attacks on the English presence in the island through the modern world, through uh, the 21st century. Other notable uh, Irish writers include Samuel Beckett, Bram Stoker, the man who invented Dracula, um, C.S. Lewis, Molly Keane, Edna O'Brien, George Bernard Shaw. All of these figures come out of this uh, fertile Irish tradition, this fertile Irish imagination, an imagination, a culture shaped by the turmoil, the tragedy, the glory that was and is Ireland. And that is how we will end our discussion <laughs> for today. Uh, does anybody have any questions? The where? On um, uh, the uh, yep. We'll go back to the map there. They um, that still had a largely Catholic population. It was far enough away from the rest of the the English Protestant territory, so that they voted to be part of the Irish Free State and the Irish Republic. Um, <laughs> angst and like fighting and stuff there? Or? Um, I'm sure there was turmoil, but you know, by the time we get to this point, many of the, um, um, much of the Protestant population had moved into those six counties, was in those, predominantly in those six counties that you see there in red. Mm -hmm. um, the rest of Ireland is and was predominantly Catholic at this time. And again, it's that sectarian division. Uh, that religious division that really becomes the defining aspect of Ireland. You have to remember that there were, in Ireland, people who were English settlers who had come over in the, uh, the 14th, 15th century, who had settled in, England, in Ireland, but they adopted Irish customs. They married Irish women. They spoke the Irish language. Um, a lot of those things were actually outlawed by the English at different points in history. Like if you were an Irish, or if you were an Englishman and you went to Ireland, you were not allowed to marry an Irish woman. Uh, the Irish language was outlawed in se at several instances. Um, it obviously, it didn't go away, but the English did try to suppress all of that over this long period of history. Yes. I'm interested in the way Hollywood has portrayed the history of Ireland. I'm thinking of films like Michael Collins and then more recently Kenneth Branagh's. Belfast, and then whether there might be a Braveheart type of movie about the <laughs> early history that... Uh, there, I don't know if Hollywood has um, broached the early history of Ireland. Certainly the, the Michael Collins movie uh, takes place during a dramatic period of the Irish Revolution, the Irish Civil War. Um, the Belfast is more recent during the Troubles, and I think the Belfast movie is actually based on... Um, on the director's own experiences living through that and Kenneth Branagh's experiences growing up in Belfast. Um, so that's much more personal kind of telling. Are there stories that Hollywood could mine? Certainly. Uh, with, a, with a history as dramatic, as tumultuous as what you get in Ireland, there are obviously a lot of stories that could be told. Whether Hollywood has looked into those stories, I don't know. Uh, when was the last time we had a good medieval epic, really, right? Uh, Braveheart, you mentioned. Braveheart is a great movie, but tremendously historically inaccurate. Um, you, you'd want something better for Ireland, perhaps. Um, now, that background, that Irish history, does provide fodder for lots of literature. There are lots of, of historical fiction, works of historical fiction that deal with the history of Ireland in different periods. Um, and you know, a lot of Irish authors have a take on that. A lot of American authors have a take on that sort of stuff because it is colorful, it is dramatic. You can put historical figures or fictional figures into the historic settings that have this stuff going on. Uh, another movie that deals with um, Irish history is In the Name of the Father with, um, yeah. <laughs> I can't think of the actor who's in it, but really good soundtrack to that movie. But um, that was in the 1990s, I think it was. Um, so, you know, again, dealing with the troubles, though, because that is, um, sadly, it, it's 
the violence of it is Hollywood ready in a way. So um, I'm sure there's good screenplay waiting to come out though. A lot of that um, painful too, to, went through a lot of bombings. Yeah, I mean the, the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, which was kind of the um, extra legal military, uh, paramilitary organization coming out of the Republic of Ireland, did use terrorist tactics in Ireland, in England, in other parts of the world. In fact, um, Louis Mountbatten, who was Queen Victoria's cousin or uncle or something like that, uh, was killed by an IRA terrorist bomb when they blew up his boat. Uh, he wasn't in England, he was somewhere in the Mediterranean, I believe. So, you know, you did have that kind of action that was, that was part of the IRA strategy um, to lead to Irish unification. So, uh, a dramatic story, a colorful story, and one that we should, uh, as we approach St. Patrick's Day, think about. It's more than just green beer and leprechauns. <laughs> Daniel Day-Lewis, yes, thank you, Daniel Day-Lewis. All right, thanks a lot.